Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here with IRAC Veteran 8888. Today we've got maybe a slightly different hunting video than you're probably used to seeing. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of chatting about recent uh, couple of hunting experiences that we had here with the Norwegian Kamalater service rifle. Uh, this gun was made in 1857 and for black powder season here in Georgia I decided to try to uh, take a, a stab at harvesting a couple of deer uh, with this particular rifle. A couple of reasons. I mean, you know, one, it's under hammer, it's quirky, and it's odd, and it's weird. Um, but, you know, it's got this really interesting breech mechanism. Uh, it still uses loose powder, uh, projectile, uh, cap, and everything like that. It's still, you know, a percussion cap uh, muzzle loader per se. But it's a behemoth of a round. It's a 69 caliber uh, projectile that weighs a little over 600 grains. And if you've never seen a Kamalata projectile, they look kind of like this. They almost look like a giant air gun projectile, all right, and they're just made out of pure lead. So we thought, hey, you know, this would be a really interesting gun to take out and do a hunt with. Uh, we had Mark Novak come down, and uh, he saw that my Kamalata was in a relatively, uh, let's just say, horrible status of disrepair in terms of its shootability. I mean, and to be fair, guys, she's old, okay? So Mark Novak took this rifle, worked his magic on it, fixed the stock, and did a, a lot of structural things uh, to help make it work right. And he also re-sleeved uh, the breech. You can see where he put a hardened chamber insert in here with a whole bunch of acro glass uh, to hold everything in place. He machined this out, re-sleeved it, and made a new nipple for the breech block. All right. Another thing that I did is I ordered a replacement rear sight uh, from a fellow over in Norway, um, and I just crudely cut it down in order to be able to use it for hunting purposes. Uh, the Norwegian Kamalata prints about three feet high at 100 yards with the military sight and a full combat load. A combat load in this rifle is 100 grains of powder with a 600 grain projectile. And then in the field we load it with a, a sabo, a paper sabo that fits against the bottom of the projectile. And then we use a felt wad and that just helps uh, provide a little bit more of a cushioning effect and allows me to really push down. Now, a lot of folks are asking in some of the uh, Instagram photos that we were posting and guys we're getting around to the hunting but I want to tell the backstory of this rifle because I think it's really important. Uh, this thing right here is called a clicking leather okay and basically what this is for is to serve as a safety because it is a under hammer okay and it also serves for dry fire practice. So if you have this in place, it slots right in there. You can squeeze the trigger and you can safely dry fire uh, the rifle without fear of damaging the nipple or any of the components. And it also serves as a safety. The hammer will not physically contact the cap and you're good to go. So if you were to cap it and then walk around in the field, you can simply just have it dropped on the clicking leather and then cock the hammer when you're ready to shoot. This is just a basic little bungee uh, rope that we fashioned up on the trigger guard for a wooden loading tool for compressing the powder and everything and for loading. Uh, because typically the projectile fit is kind of tight with the sabot in place. So you have to have a little bit to push down on it. So I just made that little wooden rod uh, to serve that purpose. Okay. So that's the rifle in a nutshell. It's a really interesting piece of history, and it's an oddball service rifle that I promise you has not taken an animal in quite a long time. Probably on this continent, at least 100 years, if not longer. Uh, so, and this is not a rifle that is common to the US anyway. So it's a double whammy. Not only are these not common to the United States, they're also not common for people to hunt with them because this is a behemoth of a gun that weighs about 14 pounds. So this is a man's rifle. I mean, you gotta, you gotta grab this sucker and go. Big old 69 caliber bore. Ballistics are basically about like a 12 gauge slug, but this is a rifle. I mean, it has sights, it has a rifle barrel. It has very, very, very good accuracy. And you'll see when we do a full review on this rifle, the accuracy that these things have is just astonishing, especially for their age. So without further ado, we'll move on to the hunt itself. So, you know, we spent a lot of time, not only with Mark Novak, but on our own, trying to work up a proper load for this gun. Okay, we spent a lot of time shooting it, and we did a lot of range work with it, just trying to figure out where the sweet spot was. Um, 
We went anywhere from about 90 to 140 grains of powder. I think we did shoot a couple of 140 uh, grain loads out of this gun. Did not hurt it one bit. Uh, it held it just fine and everything like that. But we settled on 100 grains of powder as being probably about the, the proper service load uh, for this gun. But we did proof it with 140 grain uh, loads and they certainly have a bit of thump to them, but the gun can definitely handle it. And um, so we did a lot of load development, got the gun shooting where we want. We figured out, man, this, this sight is just hitting way too high. We addressed the sight issue. We got figured out, okay, well, we know where we're hitting now. Now we're ready to get in the woods. So then we decide to go out. And from then on, it's basically just like a normal hunt uh, that you would go on with any other firearm or black powder rifle. It's just the circumstances of this hunt that make this hunt special is the type of rifle that we're using. Okay, so we got out there the first day and, uh, you know, I, I was really worried that it just wasn't going to work out very well. So I'll show you a little bit of that. Okay, I'm in the stand. Uh, we had a little bit of rain come in. We're going to hope that it passes by and maybe some of the rain covered up my scent on the way in. Give it a try. Okay, so we got out there and you can see it was raining a little bit. Uh, wasn't really sure what exactly was going on with that. Uh, so I didn't know if maybe the rain was just going to have us busted. But sure enough, a couple of does came in. And, uh, and remind, uh, mind you guys, I'm filming myself. So I literally just have like a little ledge on the outside of the deer stand that I was able to sneak my camera out of a little slot in the, in the burlap to just kind of film these deer coming in. And uh, they had no idea that I was there. Uh, a small fawn, uh, a, a relatively young fawn came in first, and then a, a much larger uh, doe came in uh, behind her. And then uh, I let them hang out for a while, and uh, I decided to go ahead and take the doe uh, with the Kamalotter. So uh, that was only like maybe a 30 yard shot. The deer was not very far away at all. So she got almost the full brunt of that 100 grains of powder and that 600 grain bullet. So it's essentially like getting shot, I guess, with a shotgun slug is the best way to look at it. And um, I fired the shot and she went right down, right where she was standing, instant incapacitation. Uh, I'm not going to show you any photos of the aftermath, but when we went down to the processor, uh, we, we you know got her all dressed out and everything and we looked at where the projectile went into her body and the projectile clipped the top of the left lung, the top of the heart, because I'm kind of shooting at a downward angle, and then it went right through her right lung, right in the middle. It was kind of a downward angle, but it went through the heart and lungs all in one go. It was a perfect shot. You could not ask for a better shot on that deer. And there was no suffering. It was instant incapacitation, and we got the, the freezer full of meat, uh, so we're good to go. We got plenty of meat uh, there from that uh, from that doe, and that was a, a successful hunt. And I, I just don't know how that could really get any better uh, in terms of you know I wanted to really take a buck with this rifle, and you know the bucks have been a little little weird lately, and you know I, the property I hunt on is a little bit highly pressured because uh, the amount of people on it, and that's fine. I'm not saying anything against the people that hunt there. But it is a relatively big piece of property that has a lot of people that hunt on it. So the bucks have been a little spooky and weird, and they've, they've gone relatively nocturnal. At this point, really the only way to get a buck to come in is going to be to rattle them in, or to maybe you know, take some cotton balls with some dough and heat estrus, maybe try to you know, get some scent to bring them in in conjunction with maybe a little bit of rattling or something, and some, some bleeding. Something like that would probably be um, the right choice. But we decided to take the Kamalotter out for another day. And I had Cameron with me uh, with Air Force Air Guns. He was down hanging out with us. So we decided to go out together and just see uh, what the heck uh, might happen. So we got in the stand. Everything's relatively normal. And we had this deer pass by and then loop around us, obviously, probably trying to wind us because we had the way we had the wind going. A lot of times a deer, you know, especially if they're coming into a food plot, they'll try to kind of cross around the outskirts of the food plot before they come in. So if you see a deer come into a food plot, chances are they've probably already tried to come in behind you because they're trying to 
they're trying to wind, you know, they're trying to pick up the scent of a potentially dangerous animal or predator. You know, you got to think, I mean, a deer is a prey animal. Uh, they're not exactly super high on the food chain compared to some animals. So deer understand that they're vulnerable to certain predators. And, you know, we do have some bears this far south, but we, you know, we have some really nasty coyotes and, uh, you know, they really will. And they, and they get rather large, right? So, you know, they're worried about predators. So, okay. And, and honestly, too, if they caught wind of a human anywhere on the property, they hate the smell of humans. So maybe they're, you know, a little bit on, on alert because maybe we made a weird sound coming in or whatever. But anyway, this deer crossed on back through and we thought, oh, well, he just passed through. Maybe we won't see him. We well, showed back up. He came in behind us and came in towards the feeder and towards the, the food plot. That entire area there is like an acre of uh, winter peas and oats and all kind of stuff we planted there for the deer. He came in and I got a little bit excited you know, I was thinking, all right, what, what's going on here? Well, um, he looked a little bigger than, uh, to me, when I was in the stand, he just looked like a bigger deer than I thought he was. It wound up being a relatively small button buck. Um, in retrospect, probably shouldn't have shot that particular buck, but the proof is in the footage. So what did we do? We decided to go ahead and take a shot at him. All right, so I fired the shot and he runs away and i'm thinking like man there's no way i missed that buck at the time i didn't know it was a buck i didn't see the buttons i thought that he was just a tiny doe or a doe i didn't really picture like a small deer but in my mind okay i shot a doe and it ran away and i'm thinking man there's no way i shot high because a few days prior i took a shot at a deer and the round went right over her back so for the week with black powder hunting, I missed one doe, but we got two in the freezer. So I shot this, what I thought was a doe, and he ran off, she ran off. You know what I mean? And I'm thinking, man, there's no way I missed this deer, right? You know, I, I just knew I hit this deer. And we got to, you know, we, we waited. You know, anytime a deer runs off, I always wait at least 20, 30 minutes so we waited a while, we waited, we waited. I'm like, okay, you know, if this deer is hit, it's obviously, it's, it's, it's done laid down somewhere. And because of the direction that I saw the deer run in after we fired the shot, I knew because of the direction he went in that he was going towards water. Usually a wounded deer will always head towards uh, a water source. So anyway, we got out of the stand, we recovered the deer. Uh, the deer got shot through both lungs, so the shot placement was absolutely perfect. The projectile missed the heart by about two inches. It was just a little bit high. I did shoot high again because the, that is the one downside on these guns is that they, they shoot notoriously high, so you have to be exactly precise of your sight picture to get the proper shot. The round did hit a little bit high, but it went through both lungs. We went out there, and we found some frothy pink blood which told us absolutely that we've got a lung shot on our hands uh, and then we followed the blood trail sure enough lots of uh, bleed a good bit of bleeding and we recovered our button buck so it wound up being a little bit smaller deer than I probably would would take in a normal day uh, I think I might have just got a little bit excited wanting to take another deer with the Kamalotter um, and everything like that but we were able to get two deer in the fridge with the Kamalotter this year for black powder season and I hunted with the Kamalotter exclusively all, all during black powder season and uh, I'll probably make this my go-to rifle for black powder uh, for primitive weapon season black powder season primitive weapon season different states call it different things but this will be my go-to rifle from now on now the challenge is going to be in fact I got the rifle right here hang on now the next challenge is going to be taking a deer with my Snyder and also with the Martini Henry. Uh, two guns that I'm a really big fan of. Now they happen to be black powder cartridge contained rifles. So they unfortunately are not legal currently under, under Georgia law to use for primitive weapon season, which I think is a shame. But it is, it is a black powder rifle. But I have to use this during rifle season because of the laws. But that gives me an opportunity to get my Kamalotter uh, shooting in during black powder season and then when rifle season opens up we're going to try to probably next 
take a deer with the, this is a Portuguese Snyder carbine in 577 Snyder. So this will be the next rifle that will be taken out to uh, try to harvest at least one deer with this particular rifle. And uh, the thought process there is it's not a drastically different approach, okay? You got a 69 caliber Kamalotter, which is a pretty big bore gun. And then you get down into the 577 that uses a relatively similar weight conical. I want to say that those uh, maxi balls that I had made are 600 grain bullets. So it's going to be really interesting to see the difference between, okay, you got like maybe 70 grains of powder with a similar weight bullet that's a little bit smaller in diameter versus 100 grains of powder with this ballistic marshmallow going down range. It's basically a lead marshmallow flying out of the end of it. So, uh, guys, we hope you enjoyed today's video. A lot of folks really wanted us to get into doing a little bit more hunting stuff. And we try to do it in a documentary sense. We really, because it's about the journey. It's about what you go through to put the hunt together more. It's not about the kill. It's not about firing the shot. Sure, the shot is the culmination of all of those things, okay? Ultimately, when you make the shot, that, that's where the rubber meets the road, right, when it comes to hunting. But I find that a lot of fun is also in the preparation, the stories, and, uh, and the things you witness, and, and I don't know, the people you're with, you always remember all of that and it becomes just kind of ingrained in you. And I think that's one of the most important things about hunting is the memories that it creates. And, uh, and it also, you know, there's a sense of being rewarded for your persistence. Uh, you know, people say, oh, you can't hunt with that old gun. Okay, right, I'll show you that I can. And it's also, I think, uh, you know, to harvesting a deer with iron sights, uh, especially using black powder, especially using a really old rifle of questionable, you know, shape and things like that. When you get into all these variables, if you can take deer with this rifle, then you know you can get behind a modern inline muzzle loader and do the job. But sometimes that's not the point. Uh, I think that using the older technology is the full embracing concept of hunting primitive weapons, black powder season, is using old school guns. Because otherwise, what lesson are you teaching youngsters um, about knowing where we came from, knowing our heritage? Remember that black powder season is about, is about honoring our heritage as riflemen, our heritage as hunters and gatherers, and you know, having the ability to take some of the oldest firearms that were used in our country and go out and harvest deer. That is the spirit of primitive weapon season is using Old, the oldest technology, in my mind, the oldest technology available. Now, granted, there's been workarounds with inline muzzle loaders, and I'm not saying that's not a bad thing. I've shot deer with inline muzzle loader. I certainly don't have a problem with it. But if you can go out and you can take a deer with iron sights with one of these old guns, then you know that come rifle season, when that giant Boone and Crockett buck shows up, that hopefully you're going to have an opportunity to shoot that you know when you're looking through that nice modern Leupold optic that gathers all the light it can, even right at last light of the day, you're thinking, there's no way I'm going to see this deer. And you look through your Leupold, and there he is, pretty as you please, and you squeeze the trigger on your nice tuned Remington 700 or, or M77 action bolt gun, and man, and just that modern propellant, and you know, it helps you appreciate the modern technologies that we have available to us. These guns paved the way for what we have today. And we always like to honor the classics. So we thought that, you know, we haven't done a hunting video in a while that it would be a lot of fun to do a video where we go as far back in time, just about as we can when it comes to percussion. So one of the next black powder videos that we're going to make for next year is we'll probably either be using a Whitworth uh, rifle and trying to take maybe some longer shots or we'll look at possibly getting into a flint lock of some sort, maybe even a match lock. So stay tuned for that. Guys, thank you very much for watching today's video. We appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it. I want to give a special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who support us monthly. Patreon is a system by where you can donate a few bucks to your favorite content creators. We donate a ton of money to all our fellow content creators to help keep them financially liquid so they can move on and do great things with their channel. If you love our content, you love consuming it, you watch it all the time, you can't wait for the newest video to drop, 
consider supporting us on Patreon, even if it's a dollar or two a month. Or if you're feeling even more generous, purchase a man can to help support our efforts. Man cans is a, pro a product that we sell to help support our channel. It's a mystery box. Lots of really cool, useful items. You can also buy stuff over on our shop, anywhere in the merchandise section. Any funds that we earn off that stuff goes right back into putting out these videos. If you love what you see, consider supporting the channel, helping to keep us going. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Get out and hunt. Be safe. Take a kid hunting. We'll see you next time.